Well, many thanks for the invitation just to share a message at Livingston. And uh, I've been looking in the letter to the Ephesians, chapter number three, and perhaps we'll read from verse number one. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we do look to God to bless his word to us. <coughs> <coughs> so Ephesians is one of these uh, prison epistles uh, that we have in the New Testament, five of course, in total. And the apostle uh, opens up, of course, very much with that setting of the prison cell, uh, verse number one, I, Paul, the prisoner. You know, I think it would be very easy for the Apostle Paul to uh, to slink into a, a kind of despondency, a, a despair. For there he is, he's, he was given the charge, you remember, of evangelizing the Western world, the Gentile world, in Acts chapter number nine. Uh, quite a charge that was. Everything almost west of Jerusalem was uh, his patch. And here he was, uh, now constrained within the prison cell. And perhaps if it was me, maybe if it was you too, uh, perhaps we would be very quick uh, simply to send up a prayer into the presence of God, let me out of here. And in a sense, the Apostle Paul begins uh, Ephesians 3 with a prayer, or at least he tries to begin with a prayer. Verse 1, for this cause. It's not until ch verse number 14 of chapter 3 that you see what was on his mind, it would seem, for this cause I bow my knees. He's going to pray. And yet he gets distracted between verse 1 and verse 14. Distracted in a very positive ways uh, with these great riches, these unsearchable riches of Christ. Now here's something interesting just to point out about Paul's experience of prison. And maybe we can apply it too in our own lives, in those moments of despair, of discouragement. Those times perhaps when we feel the world is against us, maybe sometimes it is against us, when there's pain and there's problems and there's difficulties, when we feel constrained, or, or perhaps that deep sense of aloneness, abandonment. Well, let me just highlight one little simple thought here in Ephesians 3. Did you notice the little section that we read, verses 1 to 11? And did you notice that it begins with prison, verse number 1, and it ends, verse number 11, with purpose. It begins with prison and it ends with purpose. The purpose, of course, which God purposed in Christ Jesus. And it's into that wonderful purpose of what God is doing in Christ that the Apostle Paul has been drawn into. That work in the church, for example, that work of bringing Jew and Gentile together, of sending out the gospel into the whole world, of seeing souls saved, and the Apostle Paul is part of it. But I know what you're thinking, how can he possibly be part of that uh, stuck behind bars in a prison? I mean, that really defeats the purpose, doesn't it? He's the apostle to the Gentiles, he's got this great task to undertake, and yet he's so constrained and restricted in his movements. Well, it is interesting, isn't it? Just to notice from our perspective, of course, the Apostle Paul didn't know this, but from our perspective, the world population in the day of the Apostle Paul was approximately 250 million. But, you know, because the Apostle Paul was in prison, uh, he wrote the epistle to the Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, and 2 Timothy. And as a consequence of that, those five letters didn't just reach 250 million people. One of the electronic versions which we have today available for download to mobile phones has clocked 
a number of downloads or has clocked the number of downloads of 750 million downloads just of one version alone and of course when you look at the printed versions of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians and so forth they amount to over 8 billion and so it's a strange phenomenon isn't it that in God's purpose part and parcel of his purpose for the Apostle Paul to take the gospel into the whole world was to put him in prison and from that prison comes these five wonderful epistles and those epistles come to you and me today. Now I've often thought that as I read Ephesians chapter number three it kind of echoes of a place that I have been uh, a little while ago. There is a place in London, it's a tower, imaginatively called the Tower of London. And if you were to go to the Tower of London, you would find, of course, some of the most precious possessions that the nation has. It contains the crown jewels, uh, precious from the perspective of the types of materials used in their construction. Precious stones, semi-precious stones, gold and silver. And precious, of course, because of the history and the significance attached to them. <coughs> the Tower of London is a treasure house. But if you know anything about that place, you'll know that ever before it was a treasure house, <clears throat> it was in fact, of course, a prison. And as you come to Ephesians chapter number three, uh, well, you have in a sense the Tower of London. You have a place that is both a prison, verse number one of Ephesians three, and it is also a treasure house, uh, verse number eight, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And it's in this prison that the Apostle is going to unfold these wonderful riches that we have in the Lord Jesus. Perhaps in a threefold way he unfolds these great riches. He begins with the dispensations, <coughs> verse number two. If you have heard of the dispensation of God, which has given me to you one. And he looks uh, at that great panorama of what God has done from the very beginning, Genesis, right to the very end. And of course, you and I know that not only does, uh, did God deal at different points in history in different ways, but he also did that with a purpose and with a plan. You'll remember that, for example, that dispensation of law, that had a purpose. It was a schoolmaster bringing us to Christ. And those final closing dispensations of the millennial reign uh, is a time when the Lord Jesus Christ will be enthroned and he will reign uh, from Sure to sure, he'll be seated as the sun, uh, seated there on Mount Zion, Psalm 2. And of course, in that eternal dispensation at the end, Revelation 22, you'll find that the whole of eternity is there as a reflection of the glory of the Lord Jesus. Those wonderful stones uh, that are part and parcel of the New Jerusalem, just reflective of the glory of Christ. The foundations, of course, of that place, the apostles of the Lamb. Uh, that uh, river of life that flows from the throne of the Lamb. And there, of course, the Lamb is enthroned. And there, of course, the light that comes is from the Lamb. He is the light thereof. The, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ seen in those dispensations. The apostle, of course, will also expound or at least share, touch upon this great subject of the mysteries of the Bible. <clears throat> Verse number four, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other age, age, ages was not made known unto the sons of men and is now revealed unto his holy apostles, prophets uh, by the Spirit. What a great subject that is, the mysteries uh, of the New Testament, the mystery of Christ, of course, mentioned here. I would suggest to you that in the New Testament, we have 14 of these mysteries. Now, different people will come up with different numbers. You'll maybe hear five, six, seven. Uh, I think I've heard 10, 12. I would go for 14. It just depends on whether or not you split them apart or gather them together. Um, I would see, for example, there being in Mark's Gospel, the mystery of the kingdom. In uh, Romans chapter number 11, the mystery of Israel. Uh, Romans 16, the mystery of the gospel as spread to all nations. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, you have the mystery of the gospel so far as the cross is concerned. What a wonderful mystery that is, that God saves by his crucified son. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, you have the mystery of the rapture. Uh, Colossians uh, chapter 2, you have the mystery of Christ in us. And then the, uh, in the epistle to the Ephesians, you've got three mysteries. The mystery of his will in Ephesians 1. The mystery of Christ here, which is the church, Jew and Gentile together, chapter 3 of Ephesians. And then you have Ephesians chapter number 5, uh, the great mystery of the relationship between Christ and his people, the bride and the groom. You have there, of course, in 2 Thessalonians, 
the mystery of iniquity. And of course in second in first Timothy three sixteen, great is the mystery of godliness, and then in Revelation the final three mysteries the mystery of the seven churches and stars in Revelation one, uh, the mystery of God, uh, Revelation chapter ten, uh, I believe that is off the top of my head, and the mystery of Babylon the Great, Revelation chapter number seventeen. Now fourteen mysteries. <clears throat> difficult maybe to remember, and not everybody agrees on just how you categorise them, but probably we can all remember this, and we can all agree on this, that whilst there are 14 mysteries in the New Testament, there are perhaps uh, three very distinctive mysteries. Uh, that's a simpler number, isn't it, just to remember. And these three are very interesting. These are two great mysteries and one mystery of a great thing. You'll find in 1 Timothy 3.16, Great is the mystery of godliness. That is, of course, a reference to the incarnation, the resurrection, the ascension, and the glorification of the Lord Jesus. And then in Ephesians chapter number 5, we have the mystery of the church, the relationship between Christ and his people, uh, pictured, of course, in the bride and the groom. And then thirdly, Revelation 17, the mystery of Babylon the Great. So two great mysteries and the mystery of a great thing, the mystery of Babylon the Great. You'll notice, of course, that the Spirit of God makes a distinction here between the two great mysteries, Christ and Christ and his people, and then Babylon, and all that rebel and reject Christ and his authority. I think there's a, 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 lot, uh, a lot in that, isn't there, that God sees these two uh, groups as being completely distinct, the one that would bring glory to his Son, and the one that would rebel and reject his Son. Now, Maybe if I was just to ask you <coughs> to summarise the Bible for me. That, that's, that's no small task, is it? And, and people have tried to do that over the years, to summarise the Bible. And generally it's resulted in large volumes, or maybe multiple volumes, uh, in very large bo books. We often call them systematic theologies. And uh, there are some weighty tomes, some of them very good, of course. But if I was to even make, make the challenge a little more difficult and say, can you summarise the Bible for me in three points? Mm, yeah, that's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? I wonder if you could do any better than those three points. The great mystery of Christ. Great is the mystery of godliness. The revelation, the incarnation, the resurrection the ascension and the glorification of God's Son, the Lord Jesus. Secondly, Ephesians 5, the great mystery of Christ and his church, that mystery of a people that have been redeemed out of a lost world, redeemed to be brought into a relationship now and forever with the Lord Jesus, and brought in by the exceptional and unique cost of the shed blood of God's Son, and thirdly, the removal and rejection of all that rebels against God and his Son. Babylon and those responsible, of course, for Babylon, uh, Satan, uh, the Antichrist, the false prophet, of course, all eventually will go down with Babylon. Isn't that an interesting summary of the Bible? Uh, uh, perhaps in those three points we have encapsulated the overall panorama of Scripture, the glorification of God's Son, the redemption of a people brought into a living relationship with him, and the rejection and removal of all that offends and rebels against him. And so we have here uh, the, exp or the, ex the exposition, the presentation <coughs> of this great truth of the mystery. And, and, and folks, of course, over the years have, have come to uh, these verses and, and the other verses that deal with the mysteries. And of course, they, they have tried just to to kind of summarise and, and try to define what a mystery is. What is a mystery? Perhaps like me, you've heard the preachers over the years uh, tell us that a mystery is a truth once concealed and now revealed. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that there's a lot more in it than that. In fact, that's not a, a, an entirely accurate statement, that the mysteries are truths once concealed, now revealed. Uh, it's true to say that the mystery of Christ that we have here, of course, in Ephesians 3, is a truth once concealed, now revealed. And in fact, that phrase is more or less a, a paraphrase of Ephesians 3, 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, 
as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That the mystery of Christ, the work of God in the church, was concealed in the old but revealed in the new. But that's not a definition of the mysteries. It is just one feature of the mystery of Christ. Let me give you three reasons as to why truth once concealed now revealed is not a definition of the mysteries. First of all, it's way too general. It's too generic. It's non-specific. If we view the mysteries of the Bible as truth once concealed now revealed, uh, we, we're going to have a big problem because within that box you could include almost all of the fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. I mean, what do we make, for example, of the prophecy of Isaiah? A virgin shall conceive, you say, it's impossible surely, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and they'll call his name Emmanuel, God with us. An utterly bewildering prophecy. And yet it's only in the light of New Testament fulfilment that we can really see what that meant. And so, in a sense, whilst given in the Old Testament, it was concealed, wasn't it? <coughs> now to be revealed uh, to us. Or what about Genesis 22? Uh, there the Jew reads Genesis 22 and sees the greatness of Abraham, the father of their faith. What a great man Abraham was. That's why he's the father of our nation, they would tell you. Because he utterly and implicitly trusted God, even with his son, the son in whom all of those Abrahamic covenant promises were given. And he took his son up Mount Moriah and was prepared to place him upon the altar. But you and I, looking back at Genesis 22, we can see more than that, can't we? We can see truth concealed and now revealed. For we can see that the son, Isaac, was going up a mountain, Moriah, just outside Jerusalem, as the Lord Jesus Christ would. And that he carried not wood upon his back, as the authorised text says, but in the Hebrew he carried a tree upon his back. And you see this is so very, very similar to something that I've read about in the Gospels. And that as he went up at that mountain with the tree in his back in obedience to his father, he was going to be placed upon the altar as a lamb for sacrifice, Here's the wood and the fire. Where's the lamb? Well, of course, you and I know exactly what the answer to that was. Isaac was the lamb. And so Genesis 22 would be truth once concealed but now revealed. But it's not a mystery, is it? So the mysteries of the New Testament are not simply truth once concealed now revealed. That definition is way too general. Secondly, it's inaccurate. It's not entirely true of all of the mysteries that they, that they are truths once concealed, now revealed. For example, 2 Thessalonians 2, the mystery of iniquity is yet to be revealed. Or what about Babylon? Is it, is it revealed yet? No, it's not. Uh, Revelation 17. And I would even suggest to you that there is a sense in which 1 Timothy 3.16, great is the mystery of godliness. There's a sense in which that will never be fully revealed. It will never fully reach the end of those unsearchable riches of Christ. And of course, thirdly, truth once concealed, now revealed. Well, it's a bit cryptic, isn't it? It emphasises why a mystery isn't a mystery. It's revealed. Well, that's a bit strange because right the way through the New Testament is described as a mystery. So what are the mysteries of God? Well, can you see in those three great mysteries that what we really have in the New Testament is... A summary almost of the divine plan and purpose for this universe. It's what God is doing just underneath the surface. We look at the we look at the, the surface, we look at the, the reality as we perceive it. We understand the world from what we get from the internet, from the news, from our eyes, from our senses. And sometimes we, we're totally bewildered at what God is doing. And yet if we were just to peel away the surface of the appearance of what is happening, you would see that underneath it, God is doing three things. First of all, ultimately, he's leading this world, this universe, to a place where his son will be glorified, where Christ is all in all, where everything will be subject to him. You have that in Ephesians chapter number one, the mystery of his will. Secondly, you, God is working in this world to bring out a people for himself and bring them into a relationship now and forever with the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> and thirdly, God ultimately, is moving to remove all evil and all rebellion against himself. These mysteries are not simply truths once concealed now revealed. These mysteries are God's answer to the question, what? What is God doing? Why is God doing it? And how is he doing it? This is God's plan. 
God's purpose for the universe, those mysteries, the revelation of his Son, and the exaltation and glorification of him, uh, the redemption of a people brought into a living relationship with him, the removal and the rejection of all that rebel against him. <coughs> well, the apostle has the tremendous privilege <coughs> in uh, this prison cell, uh, set apart uh, with God uh, to uh, unfold these wonderful things uh, concerning the person of the Lord Jesus. The dispensation, verse number two, uh, the mysteries, uh, verse number three and four, and of course the unsearchable riches of Christ. You know, there are things in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, that are utterly unique. What are riches? Well, sometimes we regard things as riches because, well, they, they have some exceptional value. Perhaps they've got an exceptional artistic value or maybe an exceptional technical value like you know, a Swiss watch. Or perhaps they are unique in some way. There's not much of them. They're a rare metal or a precious metal or a, 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 rare, a rare stone, a diamond. Or perhaps they have some relative value. But there are other riches that go beyond that relative or absolute value we attach to things. Perhaps we're familiar with the stories that came out of uh, uh, the Holocaust when people were being transported from uh, the Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka uh, in the transports and the cattle transports and they gathered the possessions that they had, they thought they were going to a better life. They gathered all the precious things, their diamonds, their watches, their money, their gold, their silver. And yet it became apparent that ultimately they were going to their death. Perhaps you've seen some of the films or heard some of the stories that as they stopped at these train stations, deprived of the basics of food and water, they handed out all of their precious things just for a little drink of water. You see, there are things that are riches, uh, not simply because we attach a relative value to them, but there are those things that are riches because they have absolute value. They are absolutely essential. And as we look at the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we find these unsearchable riches, those features of Christ that are unique to Christ and that are utterly essential for you and I. In thinking of the Saviour as the bread of life, uh, that which sustains and that feeds the soul, the living water that refreshes us. Oh my, how the woman found that in John chapter number four. Is he not the answer to death as the resurrection and the life? And that, of course, was the experience of Lazarus in John chapter number 11. Is he not the saviour of sinners? Is he not the one that shines his light into the darkness? That was the story of the man born blind. Is he not the one who is our peace? That's what we find, isn't it? In Ephesians chapter number two, he is our peace, bringing peace between us and God and between us and one another. He's the one who is the saviour of sinners and the shepherd of our soul. He's the one who gives access into heaven as the door and the one who leads us into that place as the way, the truth and the life. And whilst we're here, he sustains that life as the true vine and brings us into an experience of God uh, by his high priestly ministry. He's the one who comforts us in our sorrows as our comforter and a friend that stays closer than a brother. There are those wonderful features, are there not, of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, which surpass any earthly riches and any earthly value, and we find them uniquely in his Son. You know, you would wonder, wouldn't you, as you read this ministry that pours out from the prison cell of Ephesians chapter number 3, that maybe God had purpose for Paul in being in that prison, as he speaks about the wonderful plans and purposes of God and the dispensations, as he sees the movements of God and the mysteries, and as he shares something of the wonderful, unique riches that are there for us in the Lord Jesus. And maybe that's true, of course, too, in our experience. Maybe in our disappointments, our restrictions, our, our despair, our pain, our sorrow, and our suffering, and our prison, that there too God has purpose. Purpose sovereign over it all, but purpose with Christ present in it, as the Apostle Paul found here in Ephesians chapter number 3. Thanks very much.